Times is now. Um, and it's, it's about whether we should re-examine CSR, whether we should restructure CSR. Um, do, we, do we have it right? Do we have the theory right? So um, in this discussion, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Sam, Sam Lee uh, to, to moderate it. Um, we've, Sam is the CEO of InnoCSR. Uh, previous to that, he was consulting in the auto industry, uh, as well as working at UNICEF. He holds an MBA from SIEBS and also sits on the board of China CSR and CSR International in the UK. So I'd like to welcome Sam Lee to take over. Um, good afternoon. We have at least two-thirds. That's the final session, right? Um, so um, we would hopefully uh, have an interesting discussion to finish your day and the conference. Um, and uh, without further delays, I wanted to introduce you to three panelists that we have. Um, and as I call your name and the title, do please come up and, uh, and have a seat. Um, first, we have Sunny Sun, uh, so Sustainability Manager from IKEA. <laughs> Second, we have Vincent Chen, CSR Manager at TUV Ryland. And finally, we'd like to welcome uh, Ralph Thurm, Senior Advisor, BSD Consulting, and Founder and CEO of AHEAD. And let me just go over there. Okay. Um, good. So basically, um, our last session today is um, about um, integration into your business. So we had an excellent example of Unilever. And as most of you um, would think, um, so how do, we, how do we become Unilever? How do, how do we, you know, how do we even follow? Uh, it, when, I, when, I, you know, when I look at what you, Unilever is doing, they're doing so many things. Uh, we're curious, how do we change from where? You know, uh, so from... From the structural point of view, uh, and within the company, there are a lot of obstacles as a CSR manager, as a CSR director, um, to push CSR agenda. Um, for last, uh, you know, ever since CSR was born, CSR managers have been fighting uh, their biggest enemy, which is their boss, uh, trying to convince them that this is important business issue. Right? That has been the case for most of the companies. Um, the executives, as you can see on a lot of different surveys, uh, they do acknowledge that this is important, that this has relationship to the stakeholders, that they've seen the cases. But in terms of delivering the monetary values, the profit values, uh, in terms of uh, really integrating into the business, there are still a lot of challenges uh, that we have. Um, so, we are going to discuss uh, those issues. Uh, one interesting comment that I wanted to make was, um, I've, a lot of you guys do know me, and for the last uh, five, ten years, I've been trying to convince that, you know, we need to have a business approach uh, to, to CSR, um, which is somewhat still true. Um, but then recently, I ran into a, a recent research paper um, from, from Europe, uh, and it was talking about the glass ceiling of CSR uh, when you're trying to take a business approach. So 
if I sum up the paper, basically what it's saying, and this academician was saying, is if you have a business approach to CSR, uh, you're going to run into three glass ceilings, uh, transparent ceiling. And the first one is that the company will then only look at opportunities. You know, that regardless of what the social issues are, the company will only select the issue that has the maximum return for themselves in terms of the social issue. The second thing is that the current structure of the companies, uh, that they will have uh, challenges in terms of uh, carrying out the CSR. And a very good example that they gave was still the supply chain issues. You know, that we try to integrate supply chain uh, and responsible sourcing and et cetera, et cetera. But most of the companies that we know, the picture that I have is uh, your CSR department has code of conducts, has different regulations, has CSR auditing that are, if you are a multinational, that are pushed from the headquarters as well, and you are sending this down to all the suppliers through your procurement department, uh, and your procurement department is handling 400, 500 suppliers, still asking, I want the lowest price, I want the fastest delivery, I want the best quality. At the same time, can you be responsible? Right? So that itself, basically, that model itself of what they're asking in terms of procurement is built to deliver only the maximum profit. Right? So if we want to really be able to have the KPI of sustainability and responsible sourcing, that structure actually has to change. Right? Um, the final thing that uh, that paper mentioned as the obstacle was if you have a business approach to CSR, uh, basically your leaders who are passionate about uh, passionate about CSR is going to be very demotivated, right? So with all those arguments, which I do agree, um, I began to shift my thinkings into balanced integration, so balanced business approach and social approach. Anyways, that was my little introduction. Now we're going to uh, invite Sunny. Uh, to give a, a short 10-minute presentation on IKEA, which I believe is another very famous uh, company that are striving for su sustainability. Okay, Sam, Sam, uh, thanks, Sam, for the introduction, and I hope I can give a context through my presentation about uh, uh, to prepare for answer some of your questions. Uh, so, Good afternoon. I'm very glad to introduce about sustainability of IKEA. I hope that I will have a very brief introduction so that we can be ready for answering the questions. First of all, I want to share with you about our vision. In IKEA, every IKEA person, we are working for the same purpose, that is creating better daily life for the people. And by providing various types and furniture and home utensils, and which are affordable to the general public, and through our 345 uh, stores and through our employees, not only those you see in the stores, those employees include um, the employees on the whole value chain from design and development and production. So through those barriers, we can carriers, we can achieve our sustainability. Speaking of sustainability in IKEA, we can look at its positioning. So we have long-term development strategy, which is growing with IKEA. We have three goals. One is become a market leader of home lifestyle. Second is long-term profit earning power. 
and sustainability. We can see there are four pillars. So sustainability is one of the pillar. So why IKEA takes sustainability a very important thing is because we realize as a global company, for the earth, for the people, we have huge impact. Meanwhile, we also rely on the nature. We rely on the society. For many years, we have been trying to reduce our negative impact on the environment. But two years ago, if it's just uh, reducing the negative impact for the environment is not enough, so we have a sustainable um, strategy, which is good for the people and good for the environment. And with this new strategy, we have three directions. One is a more sustainable life at home for IKEA as a retailer of furniture and home products. We hope that through our products, we can help more people to have a more sustainable life at home. Second, we hope that we can and save energy and resources. Third, we hope that we can help people and communities to build a better life. And this sustainable strategy will extend until 2020. So let's talk about more sustainable life at home. Here, we have done some customer survey. We realized that our customers, 70% of them care about the environment. 90% of them care or are very interested in save more energy at home. Every year, so we will receive 700 million visitors if we can help every visitor to save some water, some electricity, or reduce wastewater usage, we can bring big changes, just like small actions, big differences of Unilever. So in terms of strategy, we hope that we can help our customers to save water usage and provide some solutions. And we can also help them to lead a more healthy life. Actually, we don't have so many products in our category, so we have about 350 products which are related with sustainable life at home. So we hope through our innovation, we can provide more products to help our consumers to achieve that. One of the examples is our solar power generator. In UK, in Sweden, in Netherlands, we have already launched that product. Another example is what we are launching worldwide is our LED light source. By 2016, we expect all the bulbs sold at our stores will come from LED light source. We'll will stop selling halogen or fluorescent lamps in the future because LED is more energy saving because we know it can save about 58% compared with halogen lamps. And we hope that with better product, we can bring different experiences to the consumers because we feel we have very similar ideas like other companies. Actually, sustainability is not the, I ask you to go back to the prim, primitive times and living in the dark or reducing your quality of life. We hope that through product innovation, we can bring better products to people's homes and we can make sustainable something enjoyable. And it shouldn't be some luxury. It should be affordable by the general pub public so that it can go to people's homes. We know that LED products are very energy saving. And because normally the cost, of, the price is high, so we are going to provide LED bulbs at a very lower price. 
So we're trying to bring better products to more households. That is one of our plans. Second is our resource and energy independence. One part is for product innovation. Another part is about about our operations for product innovation. We will have a score for each product, individual product. We call it product sustainability score card. We have eleven indicators for the scoring of the products. So whether it can be produced with less materials, whether it's made of recyclable materials, whether it is produced with sustainable materials such as FSC certified wood, whether it's sustainable cotton. And among the indicators, it will also involve supply chain and about the energy efficiency of the suppliers and the waste usage of the suppliers, and also transportation efficiency, because we are trying to improve our transport. Efficiency. So we are trying to improve the efficiency during transportation. Another thing is about aspects related with the consumer, whether the products are defined as sustainable for a sustainable life at home. So we use eleven indicators to evaluate our products. We will score each product. If the total score is above one hundred twenty, we can take it as sustainable. Right now, our goal is by 2020 in our stores, 90% of the sales revenue will come from sustainable products. And next, I'm going to talk about our operation. Of course, for operation, our major direction is energy saving, water saving, because we have a lot of. Our own stores. We have our logistics centers and factories. And for our own buildings, how do we save energy, save water, and reduce wastes? So I'll talk about our recycling energy plan by 2015 for the, our whole group. Our, we expect our investment for. Recycling energies will be five billion euro in eighteen in sixteen stores in China. Of course, our major investment is in solar energy and wind energy. We have sixteen stores. Eight of them have been st installed with、uh, solar energy, solar photovoltaic energy devices. And by investing in recyclable energy, by installing solar energy generator or wind energy generator, and through recycling energy, we hope that we can generate electricity needed for the operations. We also need to create a better life for the communities. There are two parts here. One is about the supplier management. The other part is about welfare to the communities. And for the supplier, we have a standard I-way procedures. That is for the CSR of suppliers. Maybe for the other companies, they call it code of conduct. Right now,、uh, this I-way standard was implemented since 2007. Now we have over 1,000 suppliers globally. We have 80 reviewers. We call it I-Way specialists who are supporting these suppliers to execute I-Way inspection. I want to say here we are not only. This is not only for our suppliers, for manufacturers. It is also for service providers. Like logistics, 
and retail stores, third-party retail stores, like PN, and like clean companies or security companies. And for review of iWay, we not only review ourselves, we also have third-party review. And for the public welfare and charity, we have IKEA Foundation, which is operating on that. IKEA Foundation, its target is for children. That there, there are four aspects. One is a, a place called home. Second is healthy life starts. Third, high, qual high quality of life, high quality education. Fourth is sustainable family income. By 2015, IKEA Foundation will provide support to 100 million children. Of course, we also have two donation campaigns which are for our customers and employees to have a platform to participate. One is flush toys donation, another is lighting up the world. And for the flush toys, every year after Christmas or Spring Festival, we will have about nine weeks to run the campaign. During this campaign, all the customers, when they go to uh, IKEA, and every time when they buy a flush toy, you will donate one euro, which will be used for some ch child education programs. Now we are we are working together with United Nations to support um, some schools in distant areas in China. Only last year alone, the donation globally is 10 million euro. Last year in China is uh, 660,000 euro, which is equivalent to 5 million RMB, and the amount will increase year by year. And for lighting up the refugee camp, it is still ongoing. Every year we will also have this campaign for lighting up refugee camps. We work together with United Nations Refugee Department because some countries will have some refugees because of wars. IKEA will help them to set up refugee camps. This project indicates that every time when a customer buys one LED bulb, IKEA will donate one euro for setting up uh, the lamps in the refugee camps, such as street lamps in the refugee camps. And this campaign is still ongoing. Actually, the product is a very good one, which can help you save energy. It can also help you to participate in this campaign to help more people. So welcome to join this campaign. So basically, that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Um, in terms of if you have any questions for Ikea uh, and Sunny, uh, we can take it later on when we open the questions to the audience. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, it, we were for this uh, for this panel. We're talking about business integration. Basically, how do we integrate business into our sustainability agenda and our CSR agenda? Um, I'd like to hear some opinions from uh, Vincent. Uh, in terms of your opinion and uh, and uh, all that, um, do please stick to within five minutes. Okay. Okay. 大家下午好啊。Uh, uh,
Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be in the last session because usually it's time to sum up. I'm from TUV Rhineland. In the recent seven to eight years, we help the brand. We will be able to evaluate their supply chain performance. So I want to share with you how to manage supply chain CSR. This is out of my personal understanding. First of all, how can we create a system that can manage CSR continuously? Many brands take risk assessment into CSR management framework. In a lot of occasion, the supplier, the supply chain, their impact over the brand also has to be considered. Are you my primary supplier, my tier one supplier? All of these thoughts are correct. But in the past several years, we figured out it might not be exactly accurate. When you are trying to set up the CSR strategy, Supplier's importance to you is not crucial. What's more important is how essential you are to your supplier. When you are developing your CSR strategy to the supply chain, you need to fully consider your impact over the supplier. This is one factor of the risk management as well. If your impact over the supplier is very small, but the risk is really high, what should you do? From my experience, it will be ended up with two results. First of all, you cancel and terminate the contract with the supplier because of the ethical purposes or other considerations. Secondly, maybe it's difficult to find another super, so supplier. So you need to still go with it. You mean to neglect the risk. Some people say may think the first choice is better. You need to kick them out. But uh, no matter which solution you choose, they are not responsible because you transfer the responsibility to the whole society. We want to have the third solution. You will not terminate the contract, but you need to make some actions. You need to improve their CSR performance. It seems quite ideal, but there is a way for that. A stable CSR is very important for managing the supply chain as a whole. Despite CSR or sustainability themselves, looking at the cost control and product quality alone, all brands would like to achieve a stable supply chain. As for CSR, for CSR management, if you want to make sure it's sustainable, it is very important. Uh, that's what I want to say. Thank you. Yeah. Ralph, uh, you can choose to speak in your seat or there, up to you. Thanks for giving me the choice. <laughs> I will remain seated. Um, so the issue of this session is really about um, the right level of integration, as far as I understood. And um, there is simply no one size fits all in all of this. It, it depends from industry to industry, from company to company, but you can actually look at a couple of quite principled decisions that a company needs to make in order to define what level of integration will be made possible. So to me, and I look at it rather generically, um, it all starts with a clear picture about the ambition level of a company. What do you want to achieve? And everything else is operational from that. Um, but in order to have that discussion about the ambition level, you need a certain level of leadership in your organization. Without that leadership, it's um, fighting against windmills and makes it very difficult. Um, coming back to, to, to the ambition level, um, in my work, and being in this field for 25 years now, I, I started to differentiate four types of ambition levels. Um, those companies that just want to say they Im improve, I call it become less bad, as I mentioned in my presentation. 
Um, I think these are 98% of all of the companies that say that they have a sustainability program. Um, then you have those companies that say, um, we want to you know, stick the level a bit higher. We want, to be, we want to grow, but on a zero impact basis. So that means no negative impact while growing. That's probably 1% of the companies that are out there. Um, then you have those companies that, that, um, that agree that they still have negative impacts, but they also have a lot of positive impacts. And those are those who, are, who want to become net positive. And I would say companies like Unilever and IKEA fit into that, into that category. Maybe also just 1% of, of, of the companies out there. And then there are those that say, um, after we became um, zero impact growth companies, we want to become gross positive. That means only good impact. So uh, th this is what companies in from an economic system perspective call a regenerative company or a restorative company, that, that they just simply give more than, than, they, than they took, or at least at, at, at no negative impact. I don't know any company who's there yet, um, but these, this is the sort of four different ambition levels that, that I can identify with regard to um, challenging a leadership uh, in the company and ask them, what do you want? You know, what do you want your organization to be? What do you want your organization to stand for? What sort of legacy do you want to leave behind? And from that stems the whole discussion about you know, what sort of strategies do you then need? Um, and, that, and that needs, from a leadership perspective, both the idea that um, they need to have a picture of how they might culturally change the company. Interface is one of those examples that, or Kingfisher is one of those examples, where leadership really takes the whole organization by the hand uh, and really makes it clear to everybody what sustainability really means for them. Um, so... These are, these are the, the two most important things that, that you need to um, you know, be ready with in order to define how do I now integrate uh, in the end. And for me, it is sort of a, a cycle of seven different things that uh, need to come together in order to be able to transform an organization. Leadership I mentioned, it all starts there. Uh, it's also the, the, the willingness to uh, change or to adapt a culture in an organization. Then it's then it is a, a discussion about how do we innovate in order to get there. So that ends up with a discussion about um, uh, what products and services are we going to have and what do we stand for. And, of course, it is easier for companies who start from scratch than from bigger multinational companies where I would say that 95% uh, of the innovation uh, of those companies are bought innovations. Uh, they need to be bought because there are mental stereotypes and there are existing cultural aspects in the organization that prevent them to be more innovative. There are just mental mindset shifts that are needed. And, um, you know, just as an example, you know, my old employer, Siemens, you know, they, they, um, they built turbines for, for 150 years. And it was impossible for them to invent a wind turbine. It needed to be bought, you know. <coughs> These things happen. And... Uh, so from that perspective, uh, spending billions and billions for R&D departments, from my perspective, needs to be challenged uh, in order to, to, to see what is possible. Um, then it is very much about um, measurement. You need to have a certain level of measurement to prove your case. Uh, I mentioned a couple of different uh, challenges there. So for example, um, micro-information your performance against macro information, science-based goals and stuff like that is challenging, but it's something that can prove your case, especially for those companies who want to be net positive or cross positive. Um, and that leads to a certain quality of your reporting. And then again, um, that's an important part of integration. Um, education and training is another important bit and piece uh, in, that, in that whole journey that, that all the companies are in. And a very important one also are um, incentives. You know, what level of incentives do you, um, you know, create for your organization in order to support um, mainly the, the cultural adaptation? Because leaders also need to accept that they will not be there forever. So whatever, uh, and again, Interface is a perfect example. Ray Anderson, the, the founder of Interface, um, who set them on that journey, 
1994. He died of cancer three years ago. And still the organization is really um, embracing that idea of Ray Anderson and keep it. It's, they, you know, they really embrace it very, very strongly. And all new leaderships are, or all, all new uh, members of the leadership are in that same vein. So that, that you need to install. And finally, um, governance because you need to have a certain level of effectivity of what you're doing there. And it's not about just um, defining a sort of what sort of management system do we want to have and what sort of standards are we going to use and are we going to disclose re remuneration of the board members and stuff like that. It is, governance is also a, a, a key trigger to define what and who is responsible for what in the organization. And without that clarity, it will become very, very difficult uh, to really integrate. All of these seven points, from my perspective, lead to integrated thinking, which is necessary for transformation because only then companies like IKEA or companies like Kingfisher or Unilever would have a management team that would go out there and say, guys, yes, we are leaders. We are seen as leaders. We accept that role. In the end, it's the transformation of the whole industry that is needed. So uh, even if we are leaders, if you, the other guys in our industry, don't change, we will go under altogether, um, even though we are leaders. So go on that journey with us. And those are the ones that really advocate also for an economic system change. And I didn't have the time to really talk about that very much, but it's the idea of um, Paul Polman would go to governments and say, we need the internalization of external effects into cost accounting. We need the translation of that into a pricing system. And we need a taxation system that helps us to, um, to counterbalance that um, because it shouldn't be more expensive for the normal citizen and for the normal customer. So that, that um, really um, also um, looks at, at how those leading companies are also asking others to collaborate with them. So with all of that, I think with all of those different um, aspects, coming back to the, to the beginning of the journey, it's all about ambition and to really define what ambition is, and everything else really stems from that. Um, just one last sentence, because there's, there, in, in these discussions, you always have the discussion, what's the business case of sustainability? You know, in order, uh, as long as we don't have that integration of external effects into cost accounting, the translation into pricing, the counterbalancing effect of a taxation system, this question will never disappear, because it's an economic system question and no single company can answer that question by itself. It will always be a friction. It will always be a dilemma situation. And therefore, you need a company that, that clearly says what its ambition is. Well, thank you very much. Um, now, due to the time limit, I'm going to straight open the, the, the questions to the audience. Um, and I might jump in in the middle uh, for you guys. So we'll take about two to three different questions. Any questions? Oh boy, they all want to go home. Which is okay, I think. Which is okay? <laughs> After two <laughs> long days. Right. Uh, I have, uh, if there's no questions, just one, um, one uh, question that I have. And this goes to Ralph, and then I'd like to ask your point of view. In terms, uh, you mentioned about the, the ambition, right? And most of uh, our colleagues here, um, they themselves have a very high ambition. Um, as I mentioned, we'd like to transform, we'd like to change. But they're always being challenged because, of, because they're within a for-profit company most of the time. And uh, in terms of you've seen a lot of different companies and you've been in different companies, as well as, you know, you're in a very good company, you've seen a lot of different clients. Um, how, how do we, uh, you know, set these ambitions and how can we uh, convince our colleagues and our superiors uh, in terms of, uh, we need to, delivering the message of we need to change. Because from my own understanding, the most effective way is to scare them. Right? That's, that's, the most, that's the most effective one. Saying if you don't do this, then we're going to be dead in 10 years. Right? 
then they start to listen and see the figures, right? Uh, but other than that, or even if you want to comment on that, uh, do you have any other comments? Yeah. Yeah. I, I choose a different road because I don't want to scare them because then we'll point with a finger at you and, and then we'll say in 10 years, you told me 10 years ago. No, um, <clears throat> I think it, what, what worked for me so far very much when I work with boards um, is that um, I, I also raise a certain level of awareness uh, about the urgencies that are there. Definitely needs to happen. But then um, I take a different route because most of the sustainability strategies that companies uh, are actually advocating for, I'm talking about those 98% now, not about you know, the IKEAs and Unilevers of this world, um, what they do is that they build their strategies based on symptoms and not on root causes. What, what do I mean by that? You know, if the GRI guideline says climate change is important, is an important aspect, what would a company do in order to... Um, uh, you know, to, to, um, to show their performance. They would start with an emission reduction strategy. But from my perspective, you need to go one level deeper, and that is that you talk to the board and you say, climate change, you know, that's a trend, yes, but you, don't, you shouldn't build your strategy on climate change because where does climate change come from? There are several levels of environmental degradation, uh, it's demographic effects, it's urbanization, it's you know, world uh, trade shifts, uh, technical, uh, technological developments, and so on. And a mix of all of these root causes will cause climate change. So if you now go from a symptoms level to a root cause level, you have a completely different discussion with the board because that is where they say, okay, how do we, with our products, with our services, um, you know, play into those root causes and where would we see risks and where would we see opportunities for our products and services. And then you talk about your, your, your then it comes back to ambition. Uh, then you talk about, so what do you want to stand for? What will, what, you know, what do you want to have on your gravestone, so to say, you know, when, whenever you leave the company? And Paul Pullman was, 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 was also asked that, that question and he said, you know, I, I don't want to read on my gravestone, um, I increased the profit for 20 quarters um, in my time span. I better want to read, and my children better want to read something like, this is the guy who made sure that the company still exists in 20 years. Yeah? And, um, and then they talk about strategy and what sort of products and services would play into what root cause through you know, whatever way and what could they do in the infrastructure and would they need to buy somebody who's, who was innovative in a certain area and so on. And then you're talking business and not so much anymore about, oh yeah, we have a strategy and then we also need a sustainability strategy that is built on symptoms. Um, so that's a, that's a completely different way of addressing this area to boards. And it works from my perspective because in the end you're, you're then not going to say, Oh, you need to do this because the GRI guidelines ask you to do it. Yeah? You ask them because you want them to make their business better. So from my perspective, those workshops are highly effective. Boards love it. You can, you can com combine them with uh, simulation games and you know, nice things that you can do in, in addition to that. You can take them somewhere on a, on a trip for a day where they really see the shit, yeah? where the shit hits the fan. If you combine it like that, you know, you get a deep impression uh, on board's levels, and that normally creates transformational ambition levels. I'll keep this brief. Um, it was merely an observation that we find with um, younger people, so I'm moving away from leaders now and perhaps leaders of the future, um, they're being encouraged more and more to do CSR even while they're in high school. So if you look at some of the Ivy League universities, they don't take you unless you've done some sort of a CSR sustainability related project at some stage in your gap year or perhaps even at high school. Um, so one question was, what do you find here in China? And the second is, what I've also noticed is the new generation has an opinion about the companies they want to work for, particularly large multinationals, and they want to know what you're giving back and what you're doing for the future. Um, so to what extent do you find that in your recruitment as being a criteria? Are you hiring more people with that spirit, with that mindset? So, um, 
just for the first question. And so actually we are, we see that you don't need to be an expert for, for CSR or Ecentra. And uh, uh, you, I think that uh, in IKEA, we actually explore people or talent that, uh, who have passion and willing to learn on this. For example, actually, uh, in every world store, we have one person that, uh, who are leaders on this subject. And uh, we actually are more willing to take people from internal that, uh, who have passion and who are willing to learn. So, uh, and we see also that uh, more generations are really uh, willing to take challenge on this. Uh, and also I see this is a very good uh, development um, platform for them. Because to work on this, you need to uh, develop a lot of leadership. Just to, because this is not that uh, one-man show in the store, and you need to really cooperate a lot with other departments. So actually we're encouraging people that who are taking this role and to develop themselves to be a CSR expert or sustainability expert. So we see that uh, you don't need to uh, be specialized in this. So I'm not sure if I answer your question. <laughs> so. Next, Ralph. Well, I, I, I can't speak for China um, so much um, because I'm just visiting, but um, I think one of the things that, that we need to think about possibly in the academic education is to possibly integrate a sustainability semester wherever you study and whatever you study. Because it doesn't matter if you're an architect or a doctor or an economist or whatever, you're, contrib uh, you're making a contribution to society and you can even do it way better and way more if you have a basic understanding of the nexus effects of different of the different uh, academic uh, um, uh, possibilities to study. Um, and that is not existing at the moment, and everybody's fencing sort of their, their own little profession and their own little bachelor and master and something like that. So I would love to see that, and I won't, let me end on a very positive note, because I do think that that's the next generation. Um, the way how they grow up and the way how they take on board messages from all around the world and how easily they connect they, they, they will challenge us parents. And I can speak from uh, my own experience. I have a son who's, who's 19 years old. And we're having a lot of straight discussions about um, what's the state of the world and stuff like that. And of course, he's a bit biased because I'm his father. But, but still, you know, just recently he was saying to me, you know, um, in your generation, it was a problem to not have a car. Well, I can tell you in my generation, it is a problem to have a car. And we look for other solutions. You know, we're thinking 180 degrees different than your generation did, and that's good. And I love it, you know. I, I think that that sort of thinking, we will see way more of that thinking. Um, you know, it's whatever the Internet allows us to do, the interconnectedness of different ways of being uh, mobile and stuff like that. So things will happen, and I think, you know, you and I and our generation, we just should do the goddamn best thing um, you know, spending every minute of our life to be a good example for them that at least we have started to help them in the transformation. Yeah, um, I mean, I've, I've met a lot of deans for past few weeks of different business schools um, and globally, and uh, they do have this on their agenda, especially the business school deans. So ever since the Lehman Brothers, they've been attacked by different media saying that, uh, you know, at business schools, they only teach you how to make money. Uh, and um, in terms of how to make, uh, make the right money, they don't teach you. They just teach you how to maximize the profit, right? Um, so they've been challenged a lot. Uh, the problem is the deans are, are like our CEOs. They're also not convinced. You know, that they, uh, they're convinced in their heart but then in terms of their workload and things, it's not in, on their priority plate. Um, however, there are different means, and uh, in the business school world, um, in their industry, the so-called, um, the accreditation bodies and, um, and these people are putting a lot of pressures. Uh, so if, you need to, if your school needs to get accredited, then basically... Uh, you need to have more sessions on 
sustainability and business ethics and corporate responsibilities and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is uh, what is happening. Uh, anyways, uh, we are over time, and uh, so I do need to end here. Um, the, I think that all of us do agree, and you guys also do agree, that uh, we do need to make every effort, um, and that there needs to be a balanced integration uh, of our messages uh, within our organization and, without our, uh, and outside of our organization. Well, thank you very much.